want to turn our attention now to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28, beginning with verse 1. Reading from the New King James Version, the word of the Lord is as follows. Yeah, yeah, y'all been at home so long, you forgot that we stand for the reading of the word. You were chilling out in your couch, in the bed. Oh, it didn't matter how long the scripture was. You were all right. <laughs> now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the disciples, his disciples' word. As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Thus far, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Ushers, you may be seated as well. The Ukrainian church predates the United States by at least 900 years. Before there was an America or a Christian presence in America, believers in Christ worshipped, served, and spread the name of Jesus for at least nine centuries. And with that being the case, I've wondered what type of Easter Christians in the Ukraine are celebrating. With there being victims of indiscriminate militaristic brutality and terror, how do they celebrate Easter? What might the resurrection mean to a Christian in Ukraine whose life and family has been upended by the insane and insatiable bloodlust of the Russian military fueled by a crazy leader named Putin? How does the resurrection message translate to one who fled leaving family and friends' bodies under the rubble of structures leveled to the ground by Russian artillery? What sense of meaning can be made for a child orphaned due to a bomb blast at a train station? What does Easter look like? What does Easter mean in face of outright evil showing itself with seemingly no inhibitions or boundaries? How do you proclaim the resurrection to those watching the perpetrator of such atrocities boldly and blatantly lying, spinning webs of false narratives to justify and mollify his aggression. Now, as you listen and you try to imagine yourself amidst the wreckage and rubble of Mariupol or the bodies of those strewn across the streets of Bucha, realize that you don't have to travel that far to be confronted by wreckage and rubble. No, there isn't the physical wreckage and rubble from mortar and artillery shells. 
your wreckage might be more invisible. It's the emotional and psychological rubble due to the suffering of significant losses. The explosions of familial and relational deaths have blast patterns unseen by the naked eye, but very real in the hearts and minds of those who've lost. Whether you're in Ukraine or Brooklyn after the subway shooting or Columbia, South Carolina after the mall shooting or at home after the funeral of a spouse or dealing with the diagnosis of cancer or dementia, the question is the same. How do you pick up the pieces whose fragments have been reduced to ashes? How do you help the king's horses and the king's men put Humpty back together again? What, what, what does Easter mean in 2022? I want you to think about what your 2022 is. I want you to think about what your challenges are. What are the circumstances that are plaguing you? What, what can come in your thinking at night and wake you up in a cold sweat? What does Easter mean for you in 2022? Because what, what we understand is this. The power of the resurrection is tied to whatever your predicament is. And when we think about the resurrection of Jesus, the power of the resurrection is tied to the predicament of the crucifixion. The crucifixion of Jesus presented a horrible predicament. And the predicament is multi-layered because Jesus faced a whole lot of contradictions as he died on the cross. Consider the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life. His efforts to fulfill all righteousness were aptly recorded and known. He went about doing nothing but what God the Father showed him, which was preaching, teaching, healing, and casting out demons. Jesus fed hungry people, and on three occasions, he raised the dead back to life. Now, such a person would normally be celebrated and lauded. However, his was no such plight. For all of his efforts of doing good, he is hung on a tree, suspended between earth and heaven and sandwiched between two thieves. This is a predicament, the unearned suffering of the innocent and righteous. Here is the righteous, sinless, spotless Son of God being executed as a common criminal. That, my friends, is a predicament. His being there is not due to anything that he actually did wrong, but due to the plotting and scheming and lying of those who were threatened by him. A confederation of interests culminate in handing him over to Pilate for execution. A combination of fear and hatred of Jesus propels religious leaders to secure people whose false witness against him solidifies the case for crucifixion. Jesus is the personification of grace and truth, and he is crucified due to a combination of animus and willful deceit. That's a predicament. Grace and truth, love and honesty, being overtaken by hatred and falsehood. With the religious leaders provoking both Pilate and the public with things known to be false, and the Roman soldiers unleashing the maximum amount of physical punishment imaginable. Notice, Jesus does nothing to resist them. With evil operating unrestrained, Jesus does nothing. Submission to the discipline and will of God in the midst of unrestrained evil, that is a predicament. Jesus operating within the boundaries of God's purpose and Satan recognizing no boundaries, no limits, no standard of decency. It looks as if he is operating unchecked. That's a predicament. How do you, how do you win a fight and you playing by the rules and the other person 
is not playing by the rules. And there's no referee to make them play by the rules. Seemingly, that is a predicament. But still further, look at Jesus as Jesus hangs there. Darkness comes between the six and the ninth hour. That's noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. And the full weight of God's justice comes upon Jesus as he bears the sins of the world. Jesus feels forsaken by his Father as he fully occupies our place as the atoning sacrifice. He who fully pleased God, of whom the Father said twice, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, now faces the judgment and the wrath of God. He cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the question is raised, was the shedding of his blood not enough for us? Was the look of it upon Jesus too much for God to take? Had the redemptive task been subverted? And last but not least, Jesus died. The one who raised others from the dead dies. Jesus has been death's nemesis. He's been what death can't stand. And now he's dead. Been going around raising up people. But now death finally got him. And there's no one on earth with the demonstrated power to raise Jesus. The one who raises people, he's dead. The one who defied death by raising the dead is dead. In other words, death is back in control. The finality of death seems once again to be affirmed. Jesus was but a blip on the screen. Death still has its sting, and the grave still has its victory. My friends, that is a predicament as Jesus hangs and dies. And now as he is laid into the tomb of Joseph Arimathea, I can hear the narrator from Batman saying, Is this the end of Jesus of Nazareth? Have the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes gotten rid of the rose of Sharon? Has evil overcome good, sin overcome righteousness, falsehood defeated truth, and hatred triumphed over love? Is the kingdom of darkness greater than the kingdom of light? Stay tuned. Same Jesus time. Same Jesus station. Same Jesus channel. And nothing happens on Saturday. Nothing happens Saturday night, but then Sunday comes. And with the coming of Sunday, God raises Jesus from the dead. And with the resurrection of Jesus, every predicament is resolved. Because in the resurrection of Jesus, we see that grace and truth victorious over hatred and falsehood. We see discipline, submission, conquer, unrestrained rebellion. We see God's mercy triumph over the ugliness of our sin. And yes, we see life, the life of God, swallowing up death. That would be the recognition of the followers of Jesus who experience his resurrection. And with it, they receive a proclamation a perspective, and a prospect. And for all of us living in 2022, whether here or in the Ukraine or in South Carolina, with the resurrection, we have a message to proclaim. We have a perspective to hold. And we have promises and prospects to believe. 
That's what the resurrection offers us. Just let me talk about it, and we'll be on our way to brunch together. As the women approach the tomb of Jesus, they see the stone that covered it rolled back and an angel before them with the words, and the angel says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Sensing the anxiety of the moment, the angel tells them not to be afraid. The dead Jesus, whom they came to anoint for burial, is not there. He is risen as he said. And they are to go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. They are given a message. They are given the message of Jesus' resurrection, and then they are told to go and tell the same message to his disciples. With talk of Jesus' crucifixion being their conversation on Friday and Saturday with, with conversation about anointing the body and Who's going to roll away the stone? The women are given a new conversation. Jesus is risen from the dead. The crucified Jesus is not there. He is the risen Jesus. He was dead, but now he's alive. Friends, I want every believer to know we have a message to proclaim. It's not just a message to hear. We have a message to proclaim. Jesus is risen from the dead. And you may say, yes, I know. I, no, 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 no. We announce a living Savior. He is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is the one who lives and was dead, and behold, he's alive forevermore, and he holds the keys of death and hell. Our message is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And the reason why that's important is the reason why the Jesus who raised others could die for us is because the power that he displayed was not his, but the Father's. While Jesus died on the cross, death didn't kill the Father whose power Jesus used. The God whose power Jesus used in raising Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, and Lazarus, that God, even with Jesus dead, was still alive. And before Jesus died, Jesus committed his spirit into that God's hands. When he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Death and the grave's mistake was thinking that by killing Jesus, it had killed God. But the father was still on the throne with power over death. And here's the thing. He could have exercised that power on the Friday that Jesus died. He could have exercised it on the Saturday with Jesus in the grave. But because he had set the time of Sunday before there ever was a time called Sunday, God allowed Jesus to stay there long enough until Sunday came to raise Jesus on Sunday just as Jesus said. I'm trying to help somebody. I want you to understand that this is the God who is your God. And this God who has power over death that he can exercise it any time that he pleases. This is the God who says, I can do it whenever I want to do it. But because I've set a time to do it, I'm never late when I do it. Because when I do it, I'm going to do it just like I said. That is the bedrock of our faith. Jesus raised from the dead. 
The God and Father of Jesus is the God who raises people from the dead. And there's a whole lot that we could say about Jesus in terms of his doing good, the wisdom of his teaching, the power of his miracles. But friends, that is not the essence of the Christian witness. That may tickle the ears of society. No, but that's not the essence of our witness. The essence of our witness is proclaimed by Peter in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24 and 32 through 33. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawful hands, have crucified and put to death. Here it is, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. This Jesus, God has raised up of which we are all witnesses and therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now hear and see. Here it is in Acts chapter 4, verse 10. You're going to see it. Here's some consistency. Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. By him this man stands before you whole. Acts 5, 29, 32, if that's not enough. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Maybe that's not enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For for I delivered to you all first of that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We have but one message that the world needs. Jesus died for our sins and God raised him from the dead. And it is this message of God raising Jesus from the dead that establishes Jesus as Lord. The Lordship of Jesus is established by his being raised from the dead. Acts 2, 34 through 36, Peter says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And Paul asserts the same in Romans chapter 14, verse 9. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. We don't just serve a Savior. We serve the Lord, the one unto whom everything will bow and everyone will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when you have that message, that message gives you a perspective. It gives you a perspective to hold the resurrection of Jesus reshapes and redefines life for the believer. The resurrection reconfigures our feelings and reconstitutes our bearing and reframes our perspective. When you know the resurrection of Jesus, you just don't get into your feelings and stay there because the resurrection gives you a type of perspective that can pull you out of your feelings. Lord have mercy, where would you be if God had allowed you just to stay in your feelings? But you ought to thank God that God has given you something that brings you out of your feelings. We have, we have the perspective of the power of God to absorb and to overcome. The perspective of God's power to absorb and overcome. To overcome the perspective of God's power to raise Jesus from the dead after Jesus suffered what he suffered gives us resiliency in life. Resiliency 
in life. Resilience, that, that's the ability to absorb the harsh and the brutal and the painful experiences of life and continue the path set before you. Look at him. Jesus absorbing every one of those predicaments, absorbing the contradictions, absorbing the falsehoods, absorbing the hatred, absorbing the violence, absorbing the brutality, absorbing the terror. He absorbs it and he endures it all. And guess what? He is raised in victory over it. You see, brothers and sisters, tough and tragic blows do come. I don't care who you are, how saved you are, how high up you live, the tragic will come your way. The unfair, the undeserved, the unexplainable, the horrific, and the terrible, they do come our way. And it can put you in your feelings. The resurrection of Jesus encourages us to know that through God's power, we are able to absorb them and overcome them. It's by the power of God that we absorb them. That is to say, we don't deny them. We take them. We experience them. We feel their weight. We feel their pain. We feel their intensity. We grieve their results. We mourn their losses. We lament their unfairness. We decry the injustice. We abhor the brutality. We absorb. But like Jesus, we discover that God's power to absorb is not just the power to take. It's the power to continue. Yes, 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 yes. We get hit. We get knocked down. But we get back up. We fall down. But we get back up, we persevere, we press on, we face the next day and the day after that. And whether it was in the bed or we got up out the bed, we continued and we do continue. I'm talking to somebody, life has hit you and you're still in the bed, but you're in the bed continuing. Day after day after day after day. We find ourselves doing what we've got to do for that day. And you know how we do it? Because we are not by ourselves. God is with us. God is in the midst. And he is the God who suffers tough and tragic blows. He is the one who inhabits the darkness with us. Jesus took the worst and faced the ugliest and bore the shameful and the sinful. And he says, I am that Jesus and I am by your side. In other words, there is nothing too ugly for me not to stand with you. There is nothing too dark for me not to inhabit with you. There is nothing too painful or heavy that I can't come along and be with you. As a matter of fact, I just won't be with you. I will be the one who upholds you. I will be the eternal God, your refuge. And underneath you will be my everlasting. Somebody knows that the reason you were able to face day after day after day after day is because there was a power that was wet work within you. And it did not and it was not yours but the power came from God and that God said I'm going to give you power every day I'm going to bring you through every season I'm going to take you through every circumstance this perspective gives us resiliency in life yeah yeah that's why the enemy the enemy shakes his head because he thought that that last one should have taken you out it, 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 it should have ended you. It, it should have it leveled you low. And here you come back for more. No, it's not just you coming back. It's because the God who raises from the dead brings you back. Gives you resiliency. Gives you resiliency in life. And he gives you hope in the face of death. There is no circumstance. You faced by yourself. The one who suffered his son to die on the cross. He's the one who sits with you. In the worst, in the darkness, in the ugliest. God is with you. And with every blow. 
Have mercy. God is there. With every cry, God is there. With every painful step, God is there. With every agonizing moment, God is there. His presence gives you a perspective to continue, to keep on, to persevere, and to stand. This God who stays with you in the worst does so to see you through the worst. He says, I'm staying with you to see you through. I'm staying with you to see you past. I'm staying with you to see you over. I'm not going to leave you in the worst. I'm going to stay with you until the worst is over. I'm not going to leave you in the dark, but I'm going to stay with you until the darkness turns to light. I'm going to stay with you as long as it takes for you to be able to get all you need to get out of this until I bring you out of this and that's what allows you to say like the psalmist I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart that's what allows you to say like the psalmist though I walk in the midst of trouble you will revive me you will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies that's what allows you to believe trouble won't last always that's what allows you to hold on to the word weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning resiliency resiliency in life be able to take it be able to absorb it but Jesus didn't just absorb he overcame God raised him from the dead. He took everything that death and hell could devise. And God raised him in victory. The resurrection of Jesus speaks to the power of God to overcome death, hell, and the grave. Nothing could hold him down. Nothing could hold him in. He was raised from death, here it is, and released from the grave. My friends, the power of God I need for you to understand is seen in God raising and releasing. God didn't just raise Jesus and leave him in the grave. No, no. God raised him and moved the stone and released him from the grave. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's going to hit you in a minute. It was foreshadowed by what Jesus did with, with Lazarus when Jesus called Lazarus forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And, and Lazarus came, but he came with grave clothes on. And then Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Because I'm not just going to be resurrection. I'm going to be life. And I'm able to raise you. And then I'm able to give you power to release you. To live the life that I have in store for you. And I'm trying to hit somebody right between your eyes. Because Jesus doesn't just want to raise you. He wants to release you. And by the power of Jesus, I am declaring loose mercy and be let go because Jesus comes for resurrection and release when you know Jesus comes with resurrection when you know he comes with release it doesn't just give you resilience in life but it gives you a hope in the face of death but I believe the spirit is just tarrying for a little bit on somebody getting released You've been shouting off of you being up, but you ain't been out yet. And the Lord is saying it's time for you to experience the release that God wants you to have. You've been in the grave, uh, walking around in the grave too long. It's time for the stone to be removed and for you to come out walking in the newness of life. Be released. 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 Be released, he says. Because Jesus comes with power to raise you. And he comes with power to release you. And when you understand that, he gives you hope and courage in the face of death. In a recent New York Times article entitled, How a Cancer Diagnosis Makes Jesus' Death and Resurrection Mean More. 
Tim Keller, noted Christian author, pastor, mentor to many, reflects on the resurrection in light of his pancreatic cancer diagnosis. He shares in that article how the doctor, when he told him about the diagnosis, told him, this is going to take you out. Imagine sitting in that room, receiving that diagnosis. You have preached the gospel for umpteen years, written so many books, mentored so many, planted so many churches, and now being told you have pancreatic cancer and that that will take you out. Keller shares some thoughts about the resurrection. And he says, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, then ultimately God is going to put everything right. Suffering is going to go away. Evil is going to go away. Death is going to go away. Aging is going to go away. Pancreatic cancer is going to go away. He says, I do think that the great thing about cancer is that Easter does mean a whole lot more because I look at Easter and I say, because of this, I can face anything. In the past, I thought of Easter as a kind of optimistic, upbeat way of thinking about life. He says, and now I see that Easter is a universal solvent. He says, it can eat through any fear, eat through any anger, eat through any despair. Because it is more powerful than ever before. I'm trying to help somebody understand that the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope and courage in the face of death itself. Diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in the very face of it. Why? Because you know death has been robbed of its sting and the grave has been robbed of its victory. And the question of Job, if a man dies, shall he live again, has been profoundly answered in God raising Jesus from the dead. Death is no longer the end it is no longer final with Christ being raised from the dead he is the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep for as in Adam all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive the resurrection of Christ gives us a perspective that produces resilience in life and hope and courage in the face of death. Do you hear Paul's courage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 8 through 10? For he says, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, that we even despaired of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Here it is. But in God, God who raises from the dead who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will continue to deliver us do you not hear this courage in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verses 13 through 14 and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written I believed and therefore I spoke we also believe and therefore we speak knowing that he who raised up Jesus from the dead will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us unto you. Do you not hear that courage in Philippians chapter 1 verse 31 for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you not hear it in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 6 for I am already to be being offered as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good 
fight. I finished my race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, thou shalt give unto me, and not to me only, but to all who love his appearance. Beyond everything else, my friends, there is the resurrection and life in Jesus. Everything else is temporal. Sorrow is temporal. Suffering is temporal. Evil is temporal. Death itself, it will all pass away. None are the end. The end is in God. For of God and through God and to God are all things. And therefore, when it looks like your back is against the wall, you realize this is not the end because God is the end. The women, they receive the message. They get the perspective. And now the angel references promises for the future that they are to believe. The first promise was the resurrection of Jesus as he had told them. He would be betrayed, crucified, and then raised on the third day. And as difficult as that promise may have been for them to believe, guess what? It wasn't too hard for God to keep. In fact, God kept the promise before they got to the tomb to see the promise being kept. I want you to understand, friend, that whatever promise God makes to you, it may be hard for you to believe, but it's not hard for him to keep. And therefore, the certainty in it is not in your ability to believe it. The certainty of it is in his ability to keep it. Because God is not just the speaker of promises. He is the keeper of promises. And the life of the resurrection is the life that is lived within God making and God keeping his promises. I want you to think about the God who kept the promise to raise Jesus from the dead. If he kept that promise don't you think he can keep any promise that he makes unto you regardless of how hard it is for you to believe it how difficult it is for you to fathom it God has the power to be able to keep it God gives promises and prospects for the future and also the angel then sends the women to remind the Jesus to remind the disciples Jesus made you a promise in Matthew 26 32 Jesus says but after I have been raised I will go before you to Galilee uh, here now the disciples are hiding out in the upper room for fear of the Jews because in their minds Jesus is still dead but Jesus has been raised from the dead like God said even before they see it it has already happened can I shoot you between the eyes there are some promises God has already kept before you even see it. Oh, it's going to hit you. It's going to come and get you. There are promises that God has already kept, but you haven't gotten there to see the promise fulfilled. Ah, oh, the promise has not made its way through the door for you to see that he has already clean, that he has already kept it. But I dare somebody in your spirit just to thank God for keeping it, and I haven't even seen it. For keeping it, and I haven't already felt it. For keeping it, and I'm not even here hearing it for keeping it and I'm not even there yet yeah 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 he kept it and they hadn't even seen it yet Ah, but he says, I will go before you and I'm going to meet you in Galilee. He promised to meet them in Galilee after his resurrection. He pri and that promise gave them a prospect for the future. They would see him in Galilee. And my friends, the resurrection of Jesus provides promises and prospects for the future. My God, that causes us to look towards the future with anticipation rather than anxiety. The resurrection of Jesus. Jesus causes us to prove, to look at the future with hope, to have an anchor for our souls. It gives us the words, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. We've got promises that gives us a promise 
prospect for our future. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we all shall be changed. We have promises that give us a prospect for the future, how it's all going to end up. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain will be called up to meet them in the air. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a prospect for the future that even in a dying hour we can hold on to the promises of God and say yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I'll fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs with over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for thank God for the raising of Jesus from the dead because that God is the God that raises and he is the God that releases and he is the God that can raise you out of your ashes he's the God that can release you from your ashes he is the God that can raise you from your rubble and he's the God that can release you from your rubble he is the God that can raise you from the wreckage of life and he's the God that can release you from the wreckage of life Is there anybody here who can say thank you Lord for raising me and thank you Lord for releasing me thank you Lord for lifting me and thank you Lord for loosing me thank you Lord for giving me life and thank you Lord for giving me deliverance thank you Lord for being resurrection thank you Lord for being life and now I've got the message that Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me but that's not how the story ends. Three days later he rose again and he is alive. Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. He reigns above it all. Above my trial. Above my tears. Above my troubles. Above my predicaments. Above my problems. Above my anxiety. And the Lord who reigns above it all is the Lord who can lift you above it all. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up those hands wherever you are, and let the King of glory come in. Lift them up. Lift them up. Lift your hands up above your situation, above your circumstance, above your difficulty, above your perplexity, above your problem. Lift those hands up. Lift those hands up on your behalf. Lift them up on behalf of your children. Lift them up on behalf of what concerns. Lift those hands up. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The king of glory. He is coming in. The king of glory. He is here. The king of glory. He is alive. The king of glory. He is with you. The king of glory. He is on your side. The king of glory. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Why are you saying hallelujah? I'm saying hallelujah to the King. I'm saying hallelujah to the Lord. I'm saying hallelujah to the risen one. I'm saying hallelujah to the one in whom I live. I'm saying hallelujah to the one who has power, all power, all dominion, all majesty, all glory, 